Good, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for turning up at uh, an early hour, I presume, and uh, managing to get in regardless of the traffic. Uh, it's a cold one this morning, but it's bright, and it's certainly a warm welcome for you all here at uh, this committee. Uh, just welcome you all to the first meeting of uh, 2017 of the Social Security Committee. Uh, can I just remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones, as it does interfere with the, the, the sound system? Our first uh, agenda item, agenda item one, is to take items three and four in private. Are the committee agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, our next item is agenda item two, which is the main agenda item uh, today, is an evidence session on employability programmes, including sanctions. We've got two panels of witnesses today, uh, 45 minutes each for questions and answers. And can I welcome, as I said previously, our first panel uh, today, Rachel Stewart, uh, Senior Public Affairs Officer, Scottish Association for Mental Health, uh, Dr Sally Witcher, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Inclusion Scotland, and Tommy McDade, uh, Assistant Director of Employment, Training and Skills, Bernardo Scotland, on behalf of the Young Persons Consortium. If I could just open up a, a general question to the panel, then it will be open to other members to come in and ask questions. Uh, could I please start by asking each of you what your view is of the Scottish Government's proposals for schemes for those with disabilities? Although, Mr McDade, you, you can feel free to uh, respond more generally, if you wish, uh, on the long-term unemployed as well. So I'll open it up to whoever wants to go first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think our starting point is that if you're going to deliver successful schemes for disabled people and with disabled people, you first need to really understand what it is that prevents disabled people from getting into employment. So the basis of our case is that the barriers are very often understood as something to do with the person, the individual, the individual's lack of skills, their lack of confidence, their health condition, and needs to sort of uh, manage it or learn how to self-manage it. Now, whilst that may be so for some people, it is also the case that for a lot of disabled people, none of that applies, because those aren't the reasons. Now, it is the case, though, that, that down, the, down the years, uh, employability support services for, uh, for disabled people have been based on the limited, I, we feel, understanding that it's something to do with the person that is the problem. And if that's what person-centred means or whole person means, I think we have a bit of a problem with that. So the kinds of things that can stop people, uh, disabled people getting into employment can also be things like employer attitudes, um, the fact that employers don't have the information or the support to know how, for example, to advertise roles uh, in a way that's accessible, how to frame job descriptions in a way that don't inadvertently discriminate, um, that they don't know where to go for information. So there's a whole load of, of barriers that employers can both create, but also in, in barriers that employers both experience when it comes to employing disabled people. And unless you give equal weight to that part of the jigsaw, you're going to miss quite a lot of the point. I think alongside that, uh, people have often talked about uh, employment is the route to inclusion, and I think we would might want to suggest that actually you basically need to deal with inclusion before you get into employment, because it is about things like the environment in which you live in, you know, about inaccessible buildings, transport, um, all kinds of attitudes. It's about other services. If you don't have the PA support you need through social care to get up in the morning at the right time, then you're not going to be able to get into work at the right time. So there's, it's really important to look at how these services come together, not necessarily integrated, but certainly coordinated and aligned. So in a way, what I think we, our starting point is, you need to kind of take a wider lens to this. You need to go beyond the focus solely on the person to look at the variety of different players, the variety of different uh, barriers, uh, that will never be resolved by the person themselves, that lie beyond their power to do anything about. An individual disabled person cannot change employer attitudes, cannot bring about accessible transport. <laughs> and that is, I think, the, in, in a nutshell, the reasons why sanctioning disabled people becomes so unjust, because we are, they're being penalised for barriers that are not of their making and over which they have no power whatsoever to do anything about. Much. 
Um, Toby. Yeah, um, just um, a bit, a bit more wider description of this young person's consortium. Uh, <laughs> it's a description we seem to have. Uh, have uh, taken on. Uh, it's a, essentially a partnership between Action for Children, Bernardo's and Prince's Trust across Scotland. The original driver was around uh, being able to deliver uh, quite a large scale European programme across local authorities in Scotland, focused on helping obviously young people. That's what the three charities are about. Um, around about 25 to 30 per cent of the young people who we support actually declare some, some kind of disability. So we welcome um, that focus uh, on uh, a disability-specific uh, programme. But we would also uh, point out that that specific disability programme doesn't in itself provide the whole answer to helping uh, uh, young people and adults who present with uh, a disability of some sorts. Uh, so there's a wide range of, when you say someone describes themselves as having a disability, uh, that means quite a wide range of a range of things. I would echo uh, Sally's uh, points around support. Um, any programme that we, we uh, try and support young people with, whether it's young people with disabilities or young people with particular uh, disadvantaged uh, needs, care system or ex-offenders, um, convictions, we uh, essentially make sure there is the right level of support in there for that young person. And not just for a young person, but for the employer as well. So there may be employer attitudes uh, towards recruiting young people with disabilities or young people from particular vulnerable backgrounds. But we find the vast majority of employers don't think it's a bad idea to take a young person on, regardless of the issues, capabilities that they come with. But essentially, they really appreciate the level of support that comes with that, and a huge level of support. And that isn't just about supporting the young person gaining employment. It's about beyond gaining the initial uh, phase of employment. It's about helping them stay in employment, grow in employment, develop their skills. And we see that as being one of the key tools uh, in order to you know, improve the economic uh, vibrance of the Scottish economy. Um, so we, we, we very much support a specific disabled focus, but would also point out that uh, a wider look at the, what's actually out there supporting uh, disabled young people and other young people from uh, what we would term underrepresented groups. Um, we've seen that data coming out from the DIW reports around modern apprenticeship participation. We're encouraged to see what looks like an increase in participation from these underrepresented groups. But I think there's more to do. Thank you. I would very much echo my colleagues' um, remarks in terms of the structural discrimination that people with disabilities experience and the need to ensure that all aspects of society are mindful whenever, rather than just having a, a quite a blinkered view towards this person must get this job and it is all on this person to do that. Um, we very much welcome the language that the Scottish Government has been using since it started consulting on its Fairer Scotland um, employability programmes and wider into social security benefits. The, the use of the words fairness and dignity and respect is something that we hope will be realised by the new programmes. Um, and to do so would mean a much more holistic approach to an individual when they are starting that programme in terms of their assessment, taking into, um, taking into account all of the barriers that they're facing whether that's about their disability or the other reason why they're not in employment or multiple reasons. Um, we know that people with mental health problems represent a, an enormous cohort of people who will be supported in the new programmes and they tend to be amongst the highest rates of people who have disabilities who are out of work and as such um, we were really pleased to see some language from the Scottish Government about the 2018 programmes about the use of IPS for those individuals who have fluctuating conditions and severe and enduring mental health problems. Because of the nature of that kind of support, that requires quite a lot of coordination with the NHS. It requires a lot of integration with talking to and working with employers, both before and after the individual has been placed. So we're looking forward to seeing some more detail whenever the tender information comes out in March, which the minister alluded to in his letter that was received last night. Um, we, we, are, we are really welcoming of the proposals for a, 
a more specialist disability service within the third most intensive tier. Um, I think the devil's going to be in the detail. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think a number of questions probably raise that as well. Alison Johnson, do you want to come in on that particular Yes. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, thank you for your comments about the need for that specialist support. Um, current programmes run for relatively short periods of time, and there's very much a focus on getting the person into work and, and ensuring that they stay for as long as they get sustainment payments. But often we, you know, we're aware that a lot of people are not in work after three and six months. So... Uh, that difference between getting folk into a job and into a long-lasting, meaningful career. Um, to what extent do you think employability should be focused on that longer career path? That's a, a crucial element, to be honest. Um, whenever we start to support someone through our individual placement and support programmes, we have a rapid um, holistic assessment of the individual about what their skills are, what their desires are for work, where they want to be. And it's not just a case of trying to find a job for that person that will do them and get them off the books. It's trying to find a career, something that they will be able to sustain. 60% um, of the time that our employability staff spend is actually with employers, finding the right employer to fit the person, which will then ensure that that individual gets support within the workplace, but also that there's opportunities for progression as well, and that um, can be sustained. Um, in terms of the time scales of support, um, IPS is a, it's not a fixed term amount of time and we've seen through previous DWB, DWP programmes such as Work Choice, it was a six month contract that people with disabilities were being supported and I think that there can be an element of challenge for those kind of programmes because it means that the people who are closest to the workplace can be the most desirable for providers. And we have welcomed the language about not necessarily focusing on those closest, but helping those who are hardest to reach too. Um, but with that comes challenges, which we um, wrote about in our written evidence in terms of the volumes, in terms of the funding, in terms of the process with which people will go through. Um, I think the, the main challenge is making people feel invested in it and it's they, that they have the power to actually steer towards their, um, their goal of finding a job because I think everybody wants to find a job. They, um, we spoke to some people who are getting our employment services last week and they told us that had they been going through the Job Centre Plus route rather than having their meetings in a health setting with an occupational therapist present, they would have been just taking every single job that was going for them and then two weeks later their mental health would have deteriorated to the point where they would have been unemployed again. But because they were sitting with an employability advisor and the occupational therapist and the two, the, the three-way conversation around the table meant that people were able to say, well, do you think that's right for you? Can you manage this with your medication? And she's actually ended up getting a job recently. So that has been a much more successful approach because it's been working in partnership and the, the, the person at the centre of it has been co-producing their support. So you would think um, perhaps the, the other witnesses can, can touch on that further. So it, it seems you're suggesting that there is hope that the culture of creaming off those who are closest to work um, and perhaps parking those who face more barriers may be tackled. There is hope. Um, as I said in my opening statement, we're still awaiting a lot of the information which will be crucial to how the services will be delivered from 2018. Um, we are hopeful that there will be more information about how people can be supported and what the ratios will be within the programme in terms of how many people will be going through the core programme, advanced and intensive, because that will determine the amount of money that's spent, that will determine the caseloads. And I don't know what forecasting has been done to work out how many people will be supported in each, because that will have an impact on how services are provided. Okay, thank you. I think there's always a risk of funding driving behaviour when it comes to supporting people into work. Um, the, the term work first, and I know one of the programmes has been called Work First Scotland, um, in itself taking some evidence, it's conflicting evidence, but some evidence suggests that you take a pure work first approach, get get person out of your job, 
everything else that's going on in their life just falls into place and everything's fine. Uh, that may be the case for for some people, but young people that we work with um, have lots, tend to have lots going on in their life. These external factors that can get in the way of them even starting to think about starting work, starting work and taking a job in the world of work, even thinking about it. Uh, a lot of them haven't even experienced the world of work. So we tend to describe an approach It's more around a capability approach. Is what, what are these issues that are going on in your life? Is it housing, money issues, substance misuse, for example? Can we support with that, give you the capability to support with that? We're not here to solve that for you, but we can help you cope with it yourself. And if we do that, then you're more likely to move into work and succeed in the workplace. I think one of the issues we've got in our labour market as we're seeing a, a positive in terms of an, a high employment rate, but within that we've got about 27% um, part-time employment, and within that you've got significant numbers of people who would like to work more hours and maybe don't have the opportunity. And I do think there is something in our system and an opportunity we've got to recognise that uh, it's not just about getting into any job uh, and keeping that job, but is there anything we should be doing in supporting you while you're in that job to, to grow, develop your skills, gain more skills? As a result of that, increase your hours. Or as a result of that, uh, you know, develop a really worthwhile career. So I think that's in all our interest to try and encourage as many people as possible to do that, rather than simply just saying, we've found you a job and, and away you go. Um, so I, I, I think we've got an opportunity to do that. Uh, having these devolved powers and creating our own bespoke programme um, and it's about linking what we're trying to develop with the devolved employability programmes with what we already have around skills, modern apprenticeships and potential in work support and workforce development opportunities as well. Thank you. I agree with a lot that my colleagues have already said so I won't repeat that. Um, it is indeed the case that for some disabled people it can take a very long time for a person to get anywhere even close to the labour market for a whole range of reasons that may be health related, it may be barrier related, it may be all kinds of, of, of as I've said, multiple barriers that get in the way. Um, and in a way, I suppose, it's important to kind of look not just at the, the kind of the starting point and, and straight to the being in employment. There needs to be a focus here, I feel, on the trajectory, the, the kind of the journey that people make and all the kind of interim phases that may, people may go through as they move or inch their way towards uh, paid employment. Uh, bear in mind that some people will never get there, but they may nonetheless be able to do some useful work, uh, unpaid, volunteering, uh, work-related activities that enable them to feel valued and productive and do make a contribution to the economy and to society, even though it doesn't, it's not branded and it isn't actual paid work in the way that uh, we, the employability schemes generally uh, require uh, to be the intended outcome. So that's the first point. I think the second point, though, is, uh, as I think my colleague here, Tommy, uh, referred to, so much of what, what happens is driven by sort of funding regimes. Um, and if your funding regime is predicated on... Uh, you know, payments being made not at the time through which people are being supported to get to work so much as when they actually get it and they stay in it, I think that's going to mitigate and, and really sort of uh, drive behaviours around creaming off. It will, it will just set in place dynamics which means that the focus will be about getting people into work as fast as possible. It also means, though, for example, that smaller, perhaps specialist third sector organisations simply don't have the funds to kind of maintain that uh, level of intensive and long-term support, even though they may indeed be the right organisations and the best-placed organisations to provide it. I think it also mitigates against innovation, because people don't have the space and time to do that. So... You know, that, that's, I think, sort of part of uh, a key part of uh, the, 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 the picture. It's what, let's have a focus on these intermediate, interim, smaller scale steps. Bearing in mind that some people will make two steps forwards, one step back, or even three steps back. It's not, it's not a straightforward, linear progression always. <clears throat> Finally, just to draw attention, though, to other things that may get in the way, such as the permitted work rules, <clears throat> which. Um, 
will will say basically that if you're not if you're working more than I think it's around two days, your benefits start to be effective. So there's an awful lot to think about in terms of how employability support services and the kinds of goals that we have and, and the recognition of gradual progress interface with other areas of policy that in fact prevent that, that gradual trajectory, that gradual journey, um, and require that beyond a certain point, suddenly people's benefits are affected and they cannot just move uh, slowly towards that destination. The solution may be to pay for progression towards work, yes. whether it's a... Uh, you know, specific intermediate goals like securing a job interview yep. um, or completing a course. It, it may be that, yes. Be, uh, but, but again, it sort of it comes back to exactly what you're really wanting to do here. You know, you know, em employment is obviously a very important way in which people contribute to Scottish society, uh, as in paid employment, it contributes to the economy. But it's not the only way. And the extent to which the sorts of work-related activities around volunteering, for example, um, you know, around maybe sort of work trials, around all sorts of sort of intermediate things, can be important ways in which people can contribute uh, in all sorts of ways to the economy and society. So, so it's partly driven by your overall vision of what you're trying to do here, but it's also driven by a recognition of the reality of the situation for many disabled people. Um, the amount of resource that might indeed be required to make the adjustments they would need to get into work and how realistic that is, bearing in mind that sometimes these adjustments don't cost a lot at all, if anything, but sometimes they will require expensive equipment and all the rest of it, uh, and also the fact that this needs to be a gradual process for some, very gradual, it can take a long time, and the right organisations need to be able to support that process, and they need to have the funding to enable them to do it. Thank you. Gordon Linter, you wanted to come in the quick yes. supplement. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, just on the, the points you've been talking about, what I'm wanting to ask, having discussed with individuals who have dealt with the, the system and some of their um, concerns at how their own cases have been treated, um, how important is it that if someone has special uh, needs or mental health issues, that that is identified from the very beginning of their contact with the, the system and second, what practical steps or what key practical steps would the panel members think could be put into place to ensure that that identification takes place right from the outset, if it is important? Um, uh, <clears throat> our experience um, uh, is hugely beneficial to the support we put in place and agree with a young person if we are fully aware of the issues mm. that, that, that they're getting in the way of them obtaining employment. Um, so that kind of disclosure of, of those uh, sort of issues is something we work on from the outset. But in our experience quite often, uh, perhaps understandably, it's not disclosed at the initial engagement stage, um, purely because you know relationships are not developed as, as maybe as well as they could be. And at times, it's maybe not till we're maybe three, four weeks into working and supporting that young person that they actually disclose you know, issues around mental health or, or disability or other issues that, that may be getting in the way of them uh, progressing onto employment. So it's, uh, while in an ideal world, it's great to get that information. Uh, and quite often, uh, if we are focusing on Work First uh, here or, or the Work Able programme, the, the conduit for referrals is Job Centre Plus, and again, we rely on information that Job Centre Plus may hold for that person, and that information being shared in full to be able to then understand exactly what that person needs. Uh, and again, that's an important part we need to get right with this, is working in partnership with Job Centre Plus to ensure that all information is shared. But again, I would probably suggest that there's evidence that young people or adults don't disclose that right away to, to Job Centre Plus either. So they can't put the right level of support in. And quite often that's because they feel that, that you know, they'll go to the back of the queue in terms of support, um, and we're, you know, I'm not getting that support right away. Um, and that's why a lot, of, a lot of young people in our experience are reluctant to disclose right away uh, any issues they do have. But it does come out once relationships are developed pretty quickly uh, and it ends up coming out. In terms of key um, practical steps, 
I think, as I mentioned, it is about strengthening that relationship with Job Centre Plus. I think one of the biggest risks we've got with, with the devolved employability powers is that, uh, that the welfare, the uh, vast majority of the welfare powers are remaining reserved. And, you know, evidence has shown throughout the world that a uh, closely aligned and joined up welfare system to employability system is the most effective. And if you've got that potential uh, disjointed system there, uh, then that could get in the way. And I think information sharing, sharing is potentially one example of that. Yes, please. Um, I suppose it, it, it does, as Tommy said, depend on the route through which people arrive at an employability support service. If that's been the case where some of our um, service users who've been supported through homelessness or social care come to us, then there is an automatic awareness that they have a mental health problem and it allows for a disclosure and a, a trust to be there because they have a, a relationship with the organisation. Um, but we also our IPS services are very much integrated within a community mental health team, so anyone who is getting support and has asked, would you like to find a job, are being supported by the occupational therapists, community psychiatric nurses, psychiatrists, and social care staff who would be able to link up with the employability worker and be able to phone them up if they didn't attend an appointment, for example, to say they had an episode last night and they weren't well enough, and therefore, rather than have them go to the back of the queue or for the support to be withdrawn, that flexibility is in place and that awareness is in place which allows for the relationship and the trust to be built up and continue over time to a much more successful end result, um, whether that is progression towards volunteering or a training course or something um, much softer than the, the job outcome. I think training of staff is crucial to make sure that they can ask the right questions and know where to signpost people for help if they do seem to have a mental health problem, whether that's someone who's working for a, a mental health organisation or, or out with um, within the job centre. It's, it's important that they have the, that in the back of their mind. We know that um, the voluntary nature of these programmes will hopefully be beneficial because the threat of sanctions should be removed and that is something that our service users tell us just looms over them and has a cumulative effect on how they can engage with the, um, the service. Both Work Choice and IPS, neither of them have a, a threat of sanctions because those people are, are removed from it. Just to butt in there on that particular one, mm -hmm. you've mentioned IPS on a number of occasions yeah. and having read your submission, you would say that IPS is the way forward, that's the best programme? It's, it's the most evidence-based way to support people with mental health problems into work and it does so because it's voluntary, because it has the link with health and occupational therapy and other ways which take, take away some of the barriers for, for those people who are getting support. Mm -hmm. But the the approach is very much a place then train, so people are rapidly supported into work, into competitive employment. Um, our staff will help people to move into, to, to mm. meet with employers, they'll be supported for a period of time after they actually start the work and the employer will also have the confidence to take that person on because they will have the knowledge that Samich yeah. or someone who provides IPS is going to be supporting them to put in reasonable adjustments, um, but also to make sure that that person's mental health stays on an even keel. Um, one aspect I wanted to talk about in terms of the mental health training or others was the consideration of how their disability impacts them, whether they have to take medication or mm. others which can have an impact on their participation in a job seeking process. Um, just for example, so that could mean having appointments in the afternoon rather than the morning because sometimes mm. first thing in the morning the medication can have an impact on yeah. the person. So it's, it's having a much broader view and trying to make those very small reasonable adjustments which will actually lead to a greater success rate. Thank you. Sally, did you want to come in and yes, it's Adam Tompkins. Thank you. Um, I think uh, absolutely the more you know at the start of the process uh, about the individual, um, the kinds of barriers they face, and the, and the uh, you're much obviously going to be a much better place to then develop something that's appropriate and is going to be effective. 
However, uh, in order to get to that point, you are having first to engage with the unbelievable stigma that is out there around disability um, and the fact that uh, disabled people themselves very often will reject that label. Um, and therefore, it is, as I think my colleague here said, of critical importance that the nature of the relationship between the person providing the service and the individual concerned is built on one of trust. Um, and, and it is also the case that you need to reposition or reframe it in a bit, in, in a way, so that it's not necessarily kind of um, coach client, but partners and it's co-production. It's a different, more equal kind of relationship. Um, it's also, uh, bearing in mind the stigma and the fact that anything that's marked out as this is for disabled people is probably intrinsically likely to deter a lot of people who it's designed to cater for because they won't, object that, they won't accept that label, is that there are implications here for mainstream programmes. The more accessible and, and you, you deliver main, ways you deliver mainstream programmes, say like modern apprenticeships, the more you just make the way that everybody does things as standard more accessible, uh, the less there is a need for specialist intervention. So I think the part of the strategy here is about looking at how in the just the, the, the standard way that you go about things and the employers go about it, you do it in a way that is as widely accessible as it can possibly be. So it doesn't require a person to first self-identify as disabled in order to access that support. I would say, um, that yes, it is about their impairment and getting to a place where people can explore the needs and so on, absolutely. But I think probably in some ways an even bigger problem is that there's more of an, where it's a visible impairment, there's more likely to be an overriding focus as that is the thing that needs to be sorted and less attention paid to the fact that actually that may not be the thing that needs to be sorted at all. It might be the fact that the person can't find any childcare support. So you need to look beyond, it's, it's, we're talking about the whole person. The whole person has a lot of characteristics and a lot of roles. Um, and just, again, dealing with part of that picture isn't going to work. So I, I think those are probably the main points I'd want to make on that. It does come back uh, to understanding that the individual themselves is going to be best placed to know what they need and what gets in the way of that and what's going to work and what isn't going to work to get, rid, get rid, around that barrier. And therefore, that, that says a lot, I think, about the nature of the relationship and potentially the time that is required to build that relationship uh, if that is going to be effective. Thank you very much. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Convener. I wanted to... I mean, clearly this is a, an incredibly complex um, area. Um, and you've touched on occupational therapy, you've touched on health, uh, you've touched on education. I, I just wanted to... Um, building on the back of Alison Johnson's questions about the difference between job outcomes, sustainable or sustained job outcomes and high quality job outcomes. I wanted to just to drill down a bit more into trying to understand the relationship between employability and skills training. Because the devolution of employability support is new, but the devolution of skills training is not. That's been with this parliament since its establishment in, in 1999. <clears throat> and I think one of the bits of the picture that a number of us are struggling to understand um, is the relationship between uh, employability support programmes and uh, uh, Skills Development Scotland. Um, we, deba we debated these issues in the chamber in the autumn, and we had a very helpful uh, briefing from SCBO in preparation for that um, debate, <coughs> which said, uh, for example, that 90% of new jobs require digital skills, and yet there are still more than 800,000 people in Scotland that don't or can't access the internet. So I wonder if you could help us a little bit in terms of understanding the specific relationships between employability programmes, employability support programmes and, and skills. Um, <coughs> on the skills side of, of the landscape, yeah, there's um, the skills focused um, work that SDS commissions, um, obviously a flagship programme being the Modern Apprenticeship Programme, but they also commission um, the Employability Fund, uh, which uh, is aimed at 16 to 24 year olds principally. Um, and I think there's a, you mentioned about a confusion, I think there's an argument of there being a bit of a cluttered landscape when you look at um, a lot of 
programmes, a lot of funding, a lot of support that's out there. Um, and I know there is that desire to, to align a lot of this funding going forward post-2018. Um, in terms of the skills focus, we find um, we, Barnardo's delivers uh, employability fund um, has a contract with Skills Development Scotland. We find our focus is very much on um, a combination of employability skills and development of skills for work. Um, so we combine our offer that, that recognises soft skill development, but also access to specific certification that allows that young person to have that to, to move into the job. So I, I think there's a there, there is that kind of muddied sort of landscape at the moment, if that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, um, the programmes that are on offer in the skills sector, and to, again, going back to Employability Fund, does offer a degree of flexibility for us to, to offer uh, things that suit uh, this individual that we work with. But there's also a set kind of uh, structure to them as well. Um, and similarly with employability programmes, the set structure, what would perhaps maybe an opportunity uh, in an ideal world is that you have that alignment of funding that allows uh, a more flexible uh, and bespoke offer for individuals that combines uh, enhanced employability skills, but also the skills needed to take a specific job that they're looking to do. E easier, I mean, I'm not saying easy to achieve, but easier to achieve with the devolution of employability programmes than it was before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because we, we, we in, in the past, um, quite often adjusting how you, what offer you make and how you do it, uh, depending on um, what comes down the line through DWP provision. Um, the work programme being a prime example of shifting the landscape in Scotland quite significantly, uh, and where you had a situation with the work programme that if you're on the work programme, you can't access any of the other funding that's coming through Scottish Government funded programmes, and I can understand the rationale for that. But it doesn't help joining up um, support and joining up uh, the facilities that we, we have to, to, to help people move into work. Um, I think we still have that issue potentially. You know, Job Centre Plus seem to be intention is to take on more of a, a job search support role, yeah. um, particularly for six months. I'm not clear about how the youth obligation will land in Scotland, Scotland as well through Job Centre Plus. So there is still that shifting about uh, within the landscape uh, to make sure that there isn't any duplication of what we offer. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, the opportunity we have with the Devolved Employability Programme is to align that a bit more. Um, but we don't have complete control, if you want to put it that way, of, of what's on offer because of still some reserved things sitting in Job Centre Plus. Do you want to come in that? Could I ask perhaps maybe keep the questions and the answers a wee bit succinct because we've got yeah. a couple of other members want to come in. No, no, I'm not talking about you, Tommy. I'm talking about all of us. <laughs> Sally. Uh, yes, I, I won't say much about the cluttered landscape other than the fact that there clearly is one uh, and the fact that these things are now becoming devolved does provide scope for greater uh, coordination and alignment. It is a case that for many disabled people, uh, the uh, accumulation of discrimination through education and so on means that maybe they do have uh, needs to, to kind of develop skills and, and such like. Um, and it may also be the case that where a person becomes uh, disabled or requires an impairment within work, that they, there is, it needs to be a particular focus there around perhaps reskilling or re-designing re, um, work. So I think that there are, there are particular implications for disabled people uh, in different situations. Um, and uh, the only thing I would might add is that the one thing that is not devolved, that could so usefully have been devolved, is the access to work scheme. And had that come along with it, that would have helped us hugely. Yeah, thank you. Richard, you finding that one? Mr. Tompkins, did you want to come back in again? On that? Uh, if that's right, convening, yeah, yes, very, very briefly. I mean, I was struck by something that was said by the All Party Work and Pensions Committee in the House of Commons about this um, recently, where they said one of the clearest conclusions they, they looked, you know, at, at welfare, to, what they called welfare to work programmes, quite broadly, as an All Party Committee, and it was a unanimous report, and it said that one of the clearest conclusions we draw from the evidence to our inquiry is that employment support for long term unemployed people with complex needs relies on effective integration with other locally run services. Um, including health, housing, education, skills, support for alcohol and drug addiction. And uh, so, uh, the, 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 you know, similar question to the last one, that was about the relationship between employability and skills development Scotland. Uh, are you, as 
uh, confident or optimistic going forward about the future relationship between devolved employability programs and locally run services as you are about the possibility of aligning uh, skills training with employability support um, uh, because of devolution. Are you referring to non-employability services that are locally run or uh, some, some... Well, I mean, there's a, it, 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 I think it's a reference to the whole of the complexity yeah. of the picture. I mean, we're talking about um, uh, health care, we're talking about occupational yeah. therapy, we're talking about um, drug and alcohol um, addiction services. Um, uh, you know, all of these things touch on employability, but none of them are uh, uniquely about employability. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, there's, again, there's evidence of, uh, to an extent, uh, that not being joined up with, uh, you know, health, with even transport, uh, childcare, you know, make sure there's sufficient availability of these um, services within local areas. Um, and I do think there is more work that can be done on joining that together, uh, particularly with uh, challenging helping um, disabled people into employment. Uh, but again, uh, the general uh, point I would make is that taking employability support in isolation doesn't work yeah. with particularly vulnerable people um, yeah. because they, they will be known to health, they will possibly be known to social work as well and, and joining that together is certainly a challenge of the thing that we still have. Um, but again, we do have that opportunity now with more devolved powers coming in. Did you want to come in this yes, one? please. Um, I think we're waiting for more details of how the 2018 programmes yeah. will run, but on the face of it, it seems that the pathway into that support will be still through Job Centre Plus, which is um, the only reserves um, element of the, the actual programme mm. from that point of view, other than some of the, um, the benefits as well. And what we had recommended in our response to the Fair Scotland consultation was that there should be pathways into employability support from the likes of the NHS, whether that's from primary care. If someone goes to their GP and says, I'm struggling with my mental health, I'm struggling with debt, it's really upsetting me, um, there should be a pathway from there into an employability support programme because that is what is leading to their, their mental health problems or certainly contributing a vast amount to it. Um, and I think what would be very helpful going forward would be a much more strategic focus within some of the other um, agencies and organisations within the government about employability, as much as employability should be mindful about people's housing, about people's mental health, about people's disabilities, about people's education and skills needs. Those other organisations, those other government health departments need to be thinking about, well, how do we think about jobs and work and skills and progression as something that we can help achieve our own health outcomes with? Um, we're looking forward to seeing the mental health strategy when it's published um, shortly, and we're really hoping that there will be a, a comprehensive view and a strategic outlook, um, especially within the NHS, about employability within that. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, I knew you wanted to come in on that particular one then, Ruth McGuire. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think the question that Adam Tompkins has already raised for me uh, so far is the most critical question, and I just wondered if um, you agreed with it in the sense that... So what you're describing so far um, is the, the progress we've, we've made in employability schemes that will be designed for more people and you made the case for wraparound services and what you're doing is trying to take on the individual needs of a person and support them through that process. I'm not crystal clear other than that what is contained within an employability programme in relation to skills and I just want to develop that point before you come back. I mean, given what you've said about employer attitudes, given what you've said about the stigma and everything else associated with that, if we have to get serious about um, high employment rates for people with mental health um, conditions or disabilities, it has to be a much greater connection with the agency which has had the overall supervision for skills, which is Skills Development Scotland. Um, so, so that's why I think it is a critical question. Now, I presume Skills Development Scotland already have programmes which uh, are designed through the, with the Modern Apprenticeship Scheme, or, or I don't know this, I'm assuming it. Uh, but it seems to me that that is the bit that's missing. Um, I mean, if we start to, going to tackle this question of how do we seriously get those who are furthest away from the labour market much closer, 
It has to be based on some serious um, support around skills that any one of us would need, regardless of whether we're in any of the you know, groups that you represent or not, because I think it was Adam Thompson also drew attention to that, 90% uh, of jobs require um, information technology skills, which probably a lot of the population are not even meeting. So I just wonder what your response to that is, because if you agreed with that, then it seems to me that I suppose when this committee looks at this work programme, we're going to have to push a lot harder then for that bigger connection between employability services when they eventually get commissioned and Skills Development Scotland. Mm -hmm. I don't, sorry, who wants to go first? Yes, sorry. Okay, um, could you keep your... Yeah. Quite what, do you do, what, do, what, what do you describe as skills in, in the, the programmes that we deliver? Skills for, for us is, you know, softer skills, confidence building, interview skills, um, you know, our online job search, that digital element as well. But the other side of skills, which is supported by Skills Development Scotland and the programmes that they procure, is about um, um, formally recognising the employability skills that they've developed. You know, the Certificate of Work Readiness is a prime example of that, which we deliver. Uh, but other employability certification uh, is achieved through the programmes that we deliver as well. So a young person actually has got recognition. And for a lot of them, that's the first time they've actually got any recognition at all of what they've achieved with us. And that's used to move on into employment. I think in terms of links to the devolved employability programmes, yeah, I think, again, those soft skills are delivered, but it may well be something that we have to push to be a key feature of, of that as well, is that, is that some form of certification and recognition needs to come along with that to then help the, the person move on into employment. I think there is perhaps something around skills and ongoing skills development in the workplace, again, going back to the, the numbers of underemployed that we have in the country that want to gain more, more hours of work. What, do we, what, what are we doing there in terms of developing people who are already in work, but to improve their skills and, and as a result, increase their earnings potential? Mm -hmm. Sally, do you want to come in on that? <coughs> Just briefly. Um, I, I, yes, I, certainly a lot of cases for connecting where there are currently no connections. And it includes things like how local authority employability services connect with national employability services. And I, I think that's ter at the moment really unclear. Um, and there, there are men there's really a lot of scope for doing so much better joining up than we currently have. Yes, it's about skills. It's about ensuring that mainstream programs around skills development are delivered in ways that are properly accessible. And again, I would, would wish to kind of be assured that that was the case. Um, and it's, it's about um, uh, ensuring that you're actually reaching disabled people in the first place, because I think that if communication barriers are not there, your starting point is that disabled people don't know about any of this. They can't be reached. The way things are advertised uh, are, not, uh, are not clear and accessible. And the whole thing falls down. And if you don't deal with all the barriers, it just takes one thing to fall down and the whole thing just collapses at any stage of the process. So it's about looking at skills, as we've said before. Yes, really important. Yes, we need a clear focus on that. Yes, that needs to be joined up. But it also needs to have that wider view about the other services and support uh, that may be available at local level, scope to kind of maybe align and integrate more at local level, health and social care integration, but it all needs to be done within a national framework of rights and clarity about what needs to be delivered that, with, and local flexibility in terms of how that's done. Thank you so much. Rachel, did you want to come in and reply um, to that one? I, I don't know that I would add much more to it. I mean, many you. of the people we're supporting who are in poverty, they wouldn't necessarily have the digital computer skills, but they wouldn't also have a computer in their house. So there mm -hmm. has to be some investment locally as well about um, in access to the internet, investment in libraries where people can access time on a computer too. So it's, it's not just all about the individual. There needs to be investment across society to enable people to gain those skills as well. Thank you so much. Ruth Maguire, you wanted to take a minute on that last one? Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I was struck by um, the written evidence from Sam H that um, mental health were the biggest cohort of people unable to find work due to ill health yet they had the poorest outcomes through the DWP work programme. I think it'd be helpful for us to understand um, what factors cause these poor outcomes and what role sanctions play in that. Sanctions. Do you want to go first, Rachel? I'm happy to go first. Okay. That's fine. Um, we know that 
50% of people who qualify for employment and support allowance do so on grounds of mental and behavioural disorders. And we know historically that there has been, as Sally has mentioned, um, the stigma against people with, with disabilities. And I think some of the invisible disabilities that people have with mental health problems have been poorly understood by employers. And there's been a reluctance to take people on. See Me have done some excellent work to shine a light on the stigma and discrimination that whether someone who is seeking work or in work in the workplace um, they don't get the support that they need. They're often afraid to ask for help in case that puts them first in the line for redundancies. So from a, an issue of stigma and discrimination, people with mental health problems have, have suffered in this way. In terms of the fluctuating nature of their condition, that can also make their route into work very challenging because they can be making some progress and then something can happen and they can end up hospitalised and that can remove them from the programme or they can end up taking three steps backwards um, so that can have an impact too. Uh, the issues around sanctions, <sighs> sanctions, um, the, I'm delighted that there will be this voluntary element to the new programmes because many of our service users have been sanctioned and the cumulative effect of the sanctions have been so punitive and destructive to the people that we support and to the thousands of other people in Scotland who have been sanctioned through the work programme since it began. We know that around 73% of sanctions which have been issued for people who have been claiming ESA have been for people who have registered a disability. And that means that they will lose a huge amount of money every week uh, for a number of weeks, depending on whether or not they've had a sanction before or if this is their first um, offence. And that has the loss of the money, the impact and the stress and not being able to pay their bills or you know, feed themselves or heat their houses, that has had such a, a poor effect on their mental health that it's, it's not a way to get people into work. And the National Audit Office's report before Christmas, which showed the inconsistent approach of sanctions and the lack of evidence behind them was very welcome and I hope it will be explored further by the Public Audit Committee in Westminster. Um, so from the point of view of people with mental health problems have been disproportionately affected by sanctions and they're not well able to cope with it either. Um, we also know that just because there is the stigma that many, many people self-stigmatise with their mental health problems too, they're not necessarily wanting to ask for help or say, I've got this, because they, they may not be believed. But there's also stigma about the um, employability support that they may be getting through other agencies where people aren't trained, they might think that they're at it, that they're just using it as an excuse. And that's not helpful. Um, we all have mental health. We, all, we can all go through ups and downs in our lives. And we are, I think, getting better as a country in acknowledging this. And it is something that all the parties are very committed to. So we're hopeful that it will form a lot stronger and better and fairer approach within the new programmes going forward. Okay. Did you want to come in? The, we've extended this session by 10 minutes. Obviously, it pinches on the other sessions. So we really need to finish this session at 10.25. But Sally, if you want to. Very briefly, um, I think it's fair to say that the process of going through an employability service uh, programme, uh, certainly down south, can be incredibly stressful. And therefore, having a process that is based on dignity and respect is not just only morally right, it's also entirely practical in terms of being more, much more conducive to achieving the goals that everybody wants to achieve, which is getting people into work. The only other point I quickly draw attention to is that there is a difference between people who are ill and disabled through ill health, and those people who are, who are disabled but not unwell. And it is important that the, the service kind of understands that distinction, bearing in mind, though, that things like flexible employment practices uh, and so on will decrease the impact of either of those things. Thank you so much for being so succinct, Sally. Ruth, did, 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 Ted, Ruth Davidson, you. sorry if I've, I've emulated another party there. <laughs> did you want to come back into something for just a couple of seconds or is that...? Uh, no, I suppose that the only other thing um, that, that 
sort of jumped out at me uh, in terms of the written evidence was um, from Inclusion Scotland in that um, disabled people on, on the work programme were three times as likely to be sanctioned as to find a job. And I, I just, I, I mean, it was, you know, it's quite a shocking, to be honest. I, I don't know if you want to comment further on that. Uh, I agree with you, but I'm not sure there's much else to say. It is <laughs> indicative of the nature of the process and how utterly counterproductive mm -hmm. uh, it has been. Um, and the fact now is that we have the chance to do something so much better uh, that's really going to work for disabled people and for employers um, and, and get the most out of, of the resources that Scottish people can contribute to our society. Thank, thank you very much for that, and Sally, very succinct as well. Can I thank the panel very much and just suspend the meeting for one minute to change panel members. Thank you so much for coming along. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone. Please help yourself to a glass of water and thank you very much for coming coming along today. Um, okay. We just want to welcome our second panel of the day. As I said, <clears throat> we'd run the session on 10 minutes, so you will get the extra 10 minutes to your session uh, as, as well, so it's not a problem. <clears throat> Can I just welcome Marion Davis, uh, Senior Manager, One Parent Scotland, Family Scotland, excuse me, <clears throat> Rhiannon Sims. Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland, and Pamela Smith, People Group Chair, Scottish Local Authorities, Economic Development. Long title, that particular one. Uh, similar to the first uh, panel, can I just start by uh, you know, a general question for everyone uh, to ask how your views are on how the Scottish Government should be translating its stated vision for assistance for the long-term unemployed into practice. So I'll open it up to whoever wishes to answer first. Okay. Um, I'm happy to, to kick Pamela, off. Thank you. Um, in addition to our uh, submission, I'd like just to pull out a couple of key points from the submission. Uh, the first one being that uh, local government already makes a substantial contribution to the local employability landscape, as some 85 million uh, per annum, uh, 65 of that prioritised within Council's own budget and process, and a further 20 million from the European Social Fund. Um, those monies are primarily targeted at the harder to help uh, groups, and those are furthest from the labour market. That doesn't take into account the additional resources available in social work, education, community justice, uh, social care, etc., which again adds and works with some of the individuals who are likely to be the key client group for the new developed programmes. Um, the councils as employers and service providers have a whole range of relationships with individuals who are likely to participate in employability programmes, including those devolved, as well as in receipt of a benefit. We feel, in terms of the, the current approach and the previous approach, that the whole system 
uh, approach to individuals has been overlooked. Uh, we feel that we haven't put sufficient focus on looking at the root cause, and we tend to deal with the symptoms and the consequences uh, rather than the root cause why people have multiple barriers, etc. Um, we feel moving forward, and certainly there's a lot of local uh, good practice in integrated assessment. So if we are moving to a needs-based service, rather than a service based on benefit type or entitlement, then an integrated assessment is essential. Uh, who's carrying out that assessment is also an important point, because what you would want is an integrated action plan arising. Now, that would cover things like housing, money advice, debt, health, skills, a whole range of factors that affect people being able to obtain and sustain employment and progress in employment. Also, I think there has to be a recognition when we talk about employment, we are looking at a good job and we support the government's ambition for fair work and therefore we have to be clear when we're looking at job outcomes uh, because poor jobs can affect people's health and well-being uh, and we are having to look at how we can achieve good work and fair work uh, for the, the target group. Uh, we were encouraged by the government's consultation and we indeed participated in that consultation individually as local authorities and collectively uh, through Slade, through COSLA and through SOLIS. However, we are disappointed that we feel we have lost an opportunity for greater collaboration, greater alignment and greater integration at local level. We're disappointed that the government have chosen 100% open procurement, uh, which mitigates against, in our view, innovative and collaborative approaches. Um, it also mitigates against the scope and potential for co-investment approaches with local government, given that we're talking on the developed programmes, a £20 million budget, and we already have 85 million uh, throughout the country from local government going into this agenda. We fully endorse and welcome and we support the voluntary nature of participation. We remain slightly concerned about the continuing compliance regime uh, and we remain concerned about sanctions. Uh, we await the outcome of the youth obligation and what that will actually mean for the 18 to 21 year olds. And an example of a voluntary program that's already devolved is the Employability Fund procured through Skills Development Scotland and open to DWP eligible benefit claimants. So whilst that program is totally voluntary, DWP can determine through the benefit system what benefit claimants can actually undertake and participate in. So the freedom to fully design and deliver a program may be affected uh, by the compliance conditions as we've seen within programs that are already devolved and operating. So again, that's just a slight concern. Uh, you've heard earlier from colleagues around the payment model the 30% service fee proposed, 70% job outcome fee. And again, we know that job outcomes for the target group have been particularly poor. Uh, and again, an expectation may be in the realms of 30%. Uh, therefore, there'll be real issues for those trying to do the pre-work activity from the service fee of 30%. We don't yet know um, how that group will be segmented and we don't yet know how much waiting in the fees will be from that um, 20 million, whether different groups will attract different funding rates, um, etc. Um, there are other things I'm happy to come on to when we um, start the discussion around skills. 
and around the opportunity for some transformational change, but I'm aware we're short for time, so I, as you can imagine, I could go on for hours, but I'll <laughs> catch it there, and I'm happy to come back on anything in the questions. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, Mary, did you want to come next door, Rhiannon? Yes, fine, thanks. <coughs> um, thanks very much for the invitation to, to give evidence today. Um, employability is a very important area for single parents. Um, I suppose just to outline uh, around single parents to, to let you know that um, One Parent Families works with around 8,000 families in Scotland, 8,000 single parents, and um, what we're really talking about in a sense is women, mainly women, um, most single parents are women, um, with an average age of around about 36. There is a myth around that single parents are all teenagers. In fact, single parents um, are, are uh, kind of really women returners in a sense. That uh, is, is what we're talking about. Um, we're very pleased to, to see, um, you know, kind of that uh, the work programme and the focus of the work programme is now being devolved um, to, to Scotland. Um, I would say that uh, lone parents' experiences of the work programme was not uh, was not that beneficial. Um, I think that the work programme itself was very generic and uh, there wasn't really a lot of uh, tailored programmes there for single parents. Um, and so we're very pleased that in Scotland we've got an opportunity maybe to come up with something that's uh, kind of mo more kind of, uh, kind of modelled on um, what uh, the needs are of, of people looking for employability support. Um, in terms of the, the the Scottish Government's proposals um, in our paper, we mentioned that we were a bit disappointed, uh, I think, and to reiterate the previous speaker, um, about the funding model uh, and about uh, the payment by results, which uh, is kind of very kind of small at the beginning and uh, paid when, you know, kind of late, later on in the, in the pathway. Um, because the programme is voluntary, it's, it's going to be very important that the engagement part at the beginning um, is resourced. Um, and, we, we, you know, we, we do think it's very important that, you know, there isn't conditionality. People are not going to be required to be involved in the programme. They, they need to want to be involved in the programme. And uh, we think there's a lot of agencies out there on the ground that work with single parents, work with uh, disabled people that are very good at that. Um, One Parent Family Scotland over the years has worked on various employability programmes, some of which um, originated from DWP, Employment Zone, New Deal for Lone Parents, um, and uh, we've been recently involved in Working for Families, which was a, a Scottish uh, kind of specific programme, and a programme called Making It Work, which is funded by the Big Lottery. And what all of these programmes have in common is that they had a tailored approach to the needs of single parents, recognising that single parents have that unique um, role in terms of sole responsibility for the children and sole responsibility for the economic and well-being of the family. Um, and all of these programmes um, connected in uh, different services and were holistic. Um, and at the centre of it uh, was the importance of childcare as well. Um, and so I think sort of just to, to build on what previous speakers have said is that it's very important that the new programmes are connected in to other services um, and other programmes that are already running actually um, in Glasgow for example um, they've just been funded through an ESF programme to, to have employability programmes um, and Glasgow decided to have a, a lone parent specific package um, which is tailored to lone parents needs which we were very you know, kind of pleased to be involved in so um, I think uh, there are, are very positive parts of the, the new uh, proposals. Um, I think, as we described in our, our paper, and some of the concerns that have been mentioned by previous speakers um, are, are ones that we would, you know, like to discuss and progress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rihanna. Did you want? Um, so, Citizens Advice isn't a employability support provider, and and never has been in Scotland, but um, we are one of the biggest um, providers of benefits and employment advice. Um, so we advise on over 220,000 benefits issues uh, last year, and that made up 40% of, of the advice provided. And uh, employment advice is around 15% of the advice that we provide as well. So, so we see people at... Um, both sides, I suppose, of, of the employability support programmes. Um, and I think the main point that we'd like to get across is that we um, welcome the approach uh, that the Scottish Government has taken to 
voluntary um, engagement in, in the Scottish programmes um, and also welcome that the UK government has, has confirmed that participation will be voluntary. Um, but we are also concerned about how this might in, interact with the reserved benefits and um, issues around people are expected to, on universal credit, people are expected to be looking for work for 35 hours um, a week and we recognise that probably uh, the you know, engagement in employment programmes will be, will be treated as uh, that requirement for seeking work but we'd, we'd like to make sure that um, people aren't at risk of sanctions for not, you know, if they're engaging in an employment programme for a number of hours that week, 15 hours or something, that the remainder of the 35 hours is not going to be, um, they're not going to be at risk of sanctions during that time. Um, we'd also like to make the point that we uh, recognise the value of having a mixed approach to provision um, involving SMEs and th the third sector as well as larger providers who have uh, experience in, in providing these kind of employability services. Um, and the reason for this is that those, uh, a lot of those charities and um, third se other third sector organisations know their client base um, and specialise in, in particular groups who have particular kinds of barriers to employment. Um, and from, from the clients that we see I mean, the previous panel made this point and, and my colleagues have also made the point that it's, um, it's important to recognise that we, we need more than just a narrow focus on skills and qualifications. Um, a lot of the barriers that people face are around um, much broader issues and often the, the financial situation that they're in. Um, and we're, our bureau are increasingly seeing people presenting who are in... Um, acute financial hardship mm. and who are needing uh, referrals to food banks and other forms of crisis provision. Um, so it's, it's this picture of, of people who are unable to even um, afford the basic necessities that they need, food, heating their homes, um, paying for their rent and council tax, these priority payments. Um, and it's just really important that the approach taken recognises that at that early stage um, of engagement, people need to have access to those other services in the local area that are going to help them to, um, you know, sort out some of these more basic issues that they need help and advice on. Thank you, Rhiannon. Ben McPherson, do you want to come in, George Adam? Yeah, okay, Ben McPherson, thanks. Th thank you, convener. I had a, a number of points on the evidence submitted by Citizens by Scotland, of which you've, you've covered a, a substantial amount in your opening sta statement, Rhiannon. But I just wanted to pick up again on the uh, sanctions and, and conditionality points. In terms of uh, making sure that there's an integrated approach, are there any particular examples that you could give of, of, of uh, problems that you could foresee uh, if, if there isn't that collaborative data sharing, collaborative working, collaborative thought going on between the two systems? I think um, w one thing that's on the horizon, and we don't really know how, how it's going to play out as yet, um, is in-work conditionality under um, universal credit, which um, is the idea that those who are in part-time work or low-paid work um, may be required by the, the job centre to um, seek additional employment um, or, or to try and increase their hours up to um, full-time employment. And the, the problem with this, I think, is, is that, um, it's a, firstly, it's a completely new approach which um, hasn't been tried anywhere else in the world. And so we, we're, there's not a lot of evidence on, on how that is going to work. Um, but people, it's a completely different client group, basically. So people who are in... Uh, part-time work already, by definition, aren't reluctant to to look for work. Um, it's it's likely that they're experiencing other kinds of barriers, which may be more to do with the employers as opposed to the inv individual, um, or the the um, availability of work in their local area and things like this. Um, so, 
I think that there's there's some potential concerns around that and, and how that's going to play out. Um, so I think it's really important that the in designing the new programmes, uh, the medium term and long term programmes, the Scottish Government is engaging uh, with the UK Government around what that in work conditionality is going to look like. Um, and I think I think it would be ideal, I suppose, from citizens' advice's point point of view, um, to get a confirmation that that people aren't going to be uh, sanctioned if they are engaging at all with any kind of Scottish employment program, employ, employability program, um, because they need to focus their energy on building up those skills and and receiving the support that's available, as opposed to. Um, doing that and additional requirements that is put on them by the job centre. Is, oh, is there a potential for mixed messaging within that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wonder if anyone else wanted to answer that particular question sure. before you followed but it up in that respect. Marion, did you want to come uh, on, Pamela, on that the, particular the, point? And then I say there, there are um, cases now where people, um, we've had parents who have uh, been sanctioned um, who are working part time uh, because they haven't increased their hours when perhaps the job centre thought they should have, um, but they have felt themselves that they've had reasons not to increase hours. And as Rianne was saying, there are other things around apart from um, just the job itself. You know, is the childcare in place? Are there other things that perhaps you're working part-time and maybe, you know, a lot of single parents apart from their children are supporting other family members. Um, so I think there are a lot of issues coming down the line around in work conditionality and it is something kind of very new and um, it, is bring, it is bringing in a group of people that, um, and in fact Job Centre Plus staff themselves are affected by it, um, it is bringing in a group of people that you know maybe haven't been kind of uh, brought into the conditionality regime up until now. So. Thank you. Do you want to comment on that, Pam? I'll just reiterate um, that we have to be mindful that voluntary participation doesn't mitigate against sanctions and conditionality. They're not the same thing. And just to be mm -hmm. mindful of that. Thank you. Ben, did you want to follow up on that? Was that... Just very briefly, no. thanks, convener. I, 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 as we move to a different way of approaching the employability programmes with the the, the conditionality being mitigated, uh, sorry, not mitigated, uh, removed. Um, the I thought the point you made in your, in your opening statement and in the, in the written evidence about how the, the concentration of resources at an early stage and, uh, and the, around the employability pipeline and ensuring that services are well integrated with our local, public, private and third sector support services, such as debt, housing and benefits advice. I wonder if you could comment on how the, you, the the tailoring of such services and the, the the emphasis of such services in an environment where the, you don't have conditionality might actually have a, a, a cumulative benefit of uh, more beneficial impact in terms of moving people towards more positive outcomes and employment. Um, well, C Citizens Advice provides, provides a, um, a holistic service in terms of the way that we provide advice so we if someone comes with one issue around their benefits or or debt we're looking at their um situation in the round and, and looking at you know housing and employment and how all of these things interact and i, and I think that that is a good uh, model i suppose to use for for any provision of um early engagement and early early support at the at the first stages of the so-called employability pipeline. And I think that it's that holistic approach and whoever is best placed in that local area to provide those specialist kinds of support around uh, de debt or, or financial inclusion or um, housing, and especially if somebody's tenancy is at risk or, or whatever it is, um, it, it needs to be a, a holistic approach, approach at that early stage. A lot of the services and advice that's being provided at the moment, I know this from casework in, in my constituency, is often uh, mitigating and providing support to individuals who are under pressure because of the, the sanctions and the conditionality that's currently placed on them. And I wondered in a, in a different paradigm, a more supportive paradigm with the change that's, that's coming, 
whether those support services will then have extra capacity to do more positive and constructive work rather than uh, dealing with the, the negative pressure that there is in the, in the system at the status quo. I think so. I think that the um, from previous employability support provided by the work programme, we haven't seen that that has been particularly helpful at um, su supporting people into work. We think that it, actually sanctions and conditionality are more likely to hinder people's efforts into employment. Um, I've got a case that I can provide that might demonstrate that. Um, so one of our West of Scotland Citizens Advice Bureaus uh, report, reported of a client who had received another job seekers allowance sanction. The job centre advise, advisor told him that he had been telephoned um, enough times the previous week. Uh, the client says he has a mobile phone and cannot afford to keep it topped up to call five or six times a week. He goes to the library every day to send emails to apply for jobs online, but the job centre advisor does not think this is sufficient as he could come into the job centre, even though this is a three-mile walk away for, for the client. He has no food, gas or electricity. So I, I think that case just demonstrates how the sanctions regime really works to hinder people's efforts to, to find employment as opposed to actually supporting them into, into those jobs. Indeed, thank you. I, I know you want to come in, Marion, but there's others, and you can reply to that. I'm sure the questions will go into that. But George, George Adams, you want to come in yes, on the same subject? Yes, just to follow up on exactly the type of case that you're talking about there, is the fact that, you know, you said in your evidence here that the Citizens of Ice Scotland have been concerned about the structure, how the structure will sit alongside uh, the current punitive uh, regime, which remains reserved. And uh, the work programme providers, basically they've got the opportunity where they have to report absolutely everything everything that goes on that is regarded as uh, not complying with uh, the actual uh, position. But, you know, what we heard earlier on is it doesn't give the flexibility that's needed, whereas it could be because, in a disabled person's case, transport issues, uh, and uh, the, someone basically just being able, like the gentleman you mentioned, or I'm assuming it was a male, uh, the gentleman saying he can't phone uh, because he doesn't have the money to literally do it. You know, surely... Uh, as you've said yourself, the work programme provider should be there to support people rather than monitor conditionality. Is the whole programme not getting us back to front? You know, and actually thinking, you know, maybe to coin a phrase, it would be good to actually treat people with a bit of dignity and respect, you know, because uh, we, we seem to have a situation where the, the whole humanity, the whole kind of normal way of getting about life is taken out of it and everyone's just suffering. We see it in our case load all the time, the fact that people end up coming into our office as a, their last best hope to try and get something sorted. And uh, surely we should have a system that's better than that, you know? It's Thanks. Well, it was directed at yourself, Rihanna, but obviously, you know, Marion and, and Pamela also have cases to that effect. So, Marion, did you want to come in on that particular one I, mean, I well? think conditionality sets the context of the relationship between the person needing advice or support or to you know do an employability program and the provider and um, you know if you're in a situation where you know that the person who's supposed to be so supporting you also has the you know the power to cut your benefit um, it doesn't really you know kind of, uh, result in you know a, more, a positive kind of relationship so I think um, you know we're really pleased that the conditionality and sanctioning part has has been removed and um, I mean, I think benefit is low enough as it is. I think that people who are, you know, on income support job seekers allowance, the fact that benefit is so low actually um, is a barrier to moving into work and to taking part in employability because when you don't have money, when you don't, when you're, you've got holes in your shoes, when you, you know, kind of, you're spending all your money on your kids, making sure they've got a decent standard of living, it's actually very difficult to move into work and then to be sanctioned and to lose even more than that. Um, and ends up, uh, you know, that you're visiting the food bank. It just doesn't match with looking for work and focusing on what you need to do to be able to sort of do that or to, to you know, to even at the beginning of the pathway in relation to um, very basic things like improving your confidence and, you know, meeting other people. Um, you know, that becomes difficult as well. And, and that's all very important. At the beginning, as this bit we've talked about before, is this is a voluntary programme, it, so it's encouraging um, people to become involved and see the positive side of it. And I think that's much more likely uh, than it would have been, you know, if the, there had been a sanctions regime. 
Mm -hmm. Pamela, did you want to comment on that particular point? Um, not really on that. Uh, sanction issue, just an important point about the access to local services and support. Mm -hmm. And I think that underlines the need for the integration and alignment and the size of the contract package areas mm -hmm. and the procurement, I would come back to kind of mitigates against that added value at local level um, because you will have providers covering perhaps seven local authority areas. Mm -hmm. I won't necessarily know all the local connections and the support services. Thank you. Rihanna, did you want to come in on a final point on, on that? Yeah, or? I just wanted to add a quick point, which is, um, which is that I think from the point of view of the individual, they won't necessarily know the difference between services provided that are the responsibility of the UK mm -hmm. government and services that are provided that are the, the responsibility of the Scottish government. And I think we might see a situation of good cop, bad cop mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of somebody being a bit confused about the different approaches being taken and I think it's worth um, I don't really know what the answer is to that but I think it's definitely something that's that's worth some consideration uh, by the committee and, and by the Scottish Government in, in its development of the long-term approaches. Yeah. Interesting point, thank you. Oh, okay, George, but just a quick one. Uh, just basically my colleague uh, Ruth McGuire mentioned earlier on about the fact that uh, Disabled people are three times uh, more likely to be sanctioned than anyone else. You know, surely at Citizen Advice Scotland, they'll be presenting themselves to yourself, you know, effectively in a lot of occasions. And uh, this is concerning because this is absolutely shocking that uh, the disabled people are three times more uh, likely to uh, end up being sanctioned. And again, it goes back to the flexibility, you know, being able to actually do, uh, to be able to uh, get about and get these things done. You know, have you got any further opinions on that idea? That I just find that incredible. Um, I don't have any any statistics at, to hand in terms of the number of um, the clients that we see who are sanctioned and also mm -hmm. disabled. But um, what we did do is we, we carried out an analysis last year of. Um, the clients that presented at Bureau who needed, who, who basically had some kind of gap in income um, and the majority of those were to do with um, the benefit system, whether it was you know, delays in payments or, or waiting for payments or benefit sanctions um, and we found that one, one in three of those um, had a disability and a similar proportion had a um, long term health condition as well, so it, it kind of shows the, the kind of um, dire straits, I suppose, that, that people are in um, who have um, additional, you know, health conditions and, and other other con concerns. So, okay, yeah. thank you, Mike Griffins. Thanks, Kavina. Uh, just a couple of questions around the evidence from local authorities. The first um, one was around the the funding that local authorities provide for employability support. You said that twenty million pounds of that came from. Um, the European Social Fund. Can I just ask if that's going to be impacted on as a result of the EU referendum? Uh, yeah, it will be. We currently have a, an underwriting um, from the UK government up to 2019 uh, that programmes that are already legally agreed and committed will be uh, funded beyond 2019 who knows, it's part of all the discussions and uh, negotiations. However, I would add that that is currently being match funded by 60%. It's a 40% intervention rate. And the money I refer to is the money that's been allocated to local government. There is other employability and support money uh, allocated to third sector uh, and Scottish government delivers some directly ESF funded support as well. I mean, the, the Scottish Government are talking about um, a £20 million um, fund that they've um, created for the devolved uh, powers. Um, losing that £20 million from the EU would seem to wipe that out entirely. Has there been any discussion with the Scottish Government as well um, as to what the plans are for beyond 2019 and the, yeah. the event that that funding drops off completely? Yeah, I mean, we've been talking to the Scottish Government around the whole alignment and integration agenda, and they do have an aspiration um, for that because we think we could get more 
value out of the system, um, if it was decluttered, streamlined and worked more uh, in a more integrated and aligned fashion. Um, so we are keen to look at quality rather than quantity. And I know that money is assigned against X number of places, but I think the focus should be on the outcomes and the quality. And there will certainly be a risk because austerity year after year, there is less money in the system. Uh, there's less money in employability overall this year than there was last year, um, because that 20 million has obviously been brought up from uh, are brought in from other uh, resources and we touched on apprenticeships, apprenticeship levy. There is money in other bits of the system um, to support job seekers and these clients, but how aligned and integrated it is, uh, is the point that needs more investigation. Okay. My other question was around um, the evidence that you've given on the contract package areas. Um, and you've said that you feel that the four large contracts um, aren't quite able to be as, as responsive and as localised as you feel they should be. Are you able to expand on that? And yeah. we've got the Minister coming um, to talk about this as well, perhaps set out um, what you feel the ideal contract package award would be and what benefits yeah. that would bring. I mean, from a local government perspective, given that whether people agree we should have 32 local authorities or not, uh, maybe up for debate we do have, and they are a respected tier of our local democracy and our governance. Our starting point is always 32. Uh, and albeit we have a national framework, we would want a local delivery uh, because we have community planning partnerships, we have the Community Empowerment Act, we have a lot of other structures, health boards, colleges that have certain geographies. So in our pragmatic response to the government's proposal, four is certainly too large. For example, in Fort Valley, Fife and Tayside, you have seven quite different local authorities as a contract package area. Um, on the options the government was consulting on for 2018, they had between five and eight contract package areas. We would still uh, say that that's too many um, because we don't feel it's local enough um, to integrate and to get that added value. Uh, we recognise that they're working on economies of scale and viability, but we think there's more of an opportunity cost than an efficiency gain to begin from going smaller uh, than larger. So we would still contend that even eight, which is where we uh, looked at sensible geographies, is still too many. And that's the, the higher end of what the government were consulting on. Okay, thank you. I just I wondered, sorry, Marine, I, I, Marine Davis, we were talking about geography, and, and, and Pamela wanted to raise that as well, and thank you for, for raising that particular point. You mentioned in your submission uh, basically about the employability support services and uh, uh, divided into lots by geography. Did you want to comment that particular? Um, uh, yep. Yeah. I mean, in our, our submission, we touched on that about the challenge mm -hmm. of um, you know being an organisation that's specialist when there's so many lots to bid for. Um, and uh, for example, we were involved in the. Glasgow's ESF employability bidding process, mm -hmm. and uh, it was put out, uh, you know, kind of, and uh, I mean, the, the size of some of the lots were so huge that it would have to be a really big organisation, you know, that went for it. So basically, mm -hmm. you kind of sell your wares to various bigger mm -hmm. organisations as to the benefits of us as a smaller organisation offering a specialist service. And I think sort of we touched on the link to that with the funding model because mm -hmm. with so much of it kind of uh, at the end, you know, kind of at the end of the Yeah, that, that's the when process. it's 30% procure, 70% uh -huh. results. Yeah, and then, and then the work programme, uh, just to go back to that, we were involved in that at the beginning and we were in with a, a lead, uh, but eventually we were sort of, we never actually got, and the kind of cast us aside quite near the beginning um, because the funding model meant they were really under pressure themselves. The 
it was a profit making organisation. Um, so if you if you you want to protect your own organisation mm -hmm. from deficits and you know etc., then you need to secure the model to to cover your costs. Mm -hmm. And so what happened with that was that the specialist providers kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and uh, so therefore single parents were involved in the work programme, um, part, uh, the two big providers, um, didn't really get a specialist service. They were t dealt with as generic job seekers, mm -hmm. um, which very much um, goes against like the history of working o with single parents on employability. There's been a range of specialist services shown to be more successful um, but unfortunately, Westminster uh, DWP have gone down a very generic route, mm -hmm. and they're doing away with all their specialist staff, um, and they have generic work coaches, um, which we had kind of lobbied quite hard against that. Mm -hmm. And so that was why we hoped that in the Scottish model, that there would be a recognition that certain groups, um, not just single parents but others, require that extra kind of different approach. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just. Maybe not in yeah, there I, I just had picked an, up on that on your submission. It was not unsimilar to Pamela's group's submission in that. But Alison Jones, you were coming yeah, it, in. It, it, it was on that point about gender-sensitive employability services. Now, that obviously has an impact on one-parent families, the huge majority of whom are women. Um, you know, and gender have said that current programmes that take generic approaches to employability are likely to replicate gendered patterns of skills acquisition and, employ and employment. So, you know, entrenching occupational segregation and, and just widening the gender pay gap. So, um, I presume you'd like to, us to take forward the message that we really need to tackle this because it could have really positive implications if we got this right. Yeah. And, and also Pamela Smith then um, pointed out concerns about the procurement process that maybe mean it's less likely that we can move towards that different model? Yes, I mean, I think as far as employability and single parents is concerned, gender is at the core. Um, because 92% of single parents are women, um, it, you know, the, the, the whole issue around gender and, and, and uh, gender kind of uh, monitoring of programmes is very important. Um, particularly for single parents, what we have felt and what they've told us is that something that's very difficult uh, to take part in generic programmes um, which don't take into account perhaps the experiences that women have had, um, that a lot of the single parents we've worked with have maybe been affected by domestic abuse or there's things that have happened to them in their life that they completely lack confidence and self-esteem. And um, we've always kind of felt that it's very positive to have something where you bring women together and they can support each other. And I think some of that maybe is, is missing a bit in terms of like what we've read so far about the, 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 the proposed programmes. And um, I think linking into that, um, the co-production part, which on the other side of things in terms of like devolved benefits and in the social security, there's been so much work being done in that area around participation, about co-production, you know, about having panels of participants commenting on the new benefits. Um, and it seems that that bit maybe is not in there in terms of the employability proposals and like actually touching base with people who are going to be going through the programmes and asking them. And I don't think it's not, it doesn't seem to be kind of built in. It's a, quite a kind of commercial approach. Um, and uh, we were sort of a bit disappointed with that. And I think um, a few other submissions that I did also feel that maybe it's replicating in some ways the model that we've already had. Um, having said that, obviously, we don't have the conditionality, which is fantastic. But um, it's just perhaps not as innovative um, uh, you know, the option that's gone down as, as we would maybe have hoped for. Can I just ask a tiny just little question a on that? A tiny wee question. We need to finish. Uh, I know that Adam Thompson has wanted to come in. Are you, you sure? Fine. Thank okay, you. Alison. Um, just about that, the voluntary nature of the programmes. Now, people are, you know, they'll hear by word of mouth, I suppose, how, how effective they are, what an impact they've had. Do you think that voluntary nature of the employability programmes themselves might mean that the quality and approach changes? I mean, certain mo well, not most, all of the programmes we've been involved in have been voluntary and we've had, uh, as have other organisations through Working for Families and, I mean, Working for Families was evaluated by Napier Uni as incredibly successful, had in, you know, really high success rates. The programme we've been involved in, Making It Work, voluntary, um, has incredibly high interwork success rates. 
Um, we recently have been involved in a March and Start programme, um, supporting single parents into to, to working with March and Spencers, and that was voluntary. It's got like a 60% into work success rate. So I think we have no worries around, certainly single parents do want to access employability, they do want to move into work, um, and research shows that, so I think um, it will be a vast improvement, and I think uh, people will enjoy it more as well, I think, if something's something you want to do and you are not <laughs> got a cloud over your head that you're going to have your, your benefit cut because you're late for an appointment or you can't attend a training programme because you don't have childcare, then it's going to be a much more positive experience. Thank you. Can I come in? On yep, yeah, for about six seconds, <laughs> please. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say, I think it's no doubt going to improve quality of the programmes delivered, but I th it's also, I would say that even voluntary schemes are not necessarily without their problems, and I wouldn't like to be overly critical, but I, th I heard a story about um, the uh, community jobs Scotland programme which is delivered by SCVO and has fantastic results and helps a lot of people um, but one uh, colleague of mine who works in a bureau was um, w had one of these Community Jobs Scotland placements and um, it was only for 25 hours a week and it was on the national minimum mm. wage and I don't know if it's changed now it might be the living wage these days but um, it meant that she because she was under 25 as well she, she was having to survive on a very small amount of money and um, she couldn't increase her hours. It was limited to that 25 hours a week. And it was a step into employment, but it meant that, you know, she was really struggling to make those, the, the payments that she had to make to pay for her rent and all, all of these things. So it's, it's worth remembering that um, with what, whatever programmes we put in place and what, whatever options we're offering to people, that mm -hmm. they're adequate to, to cover people's basic yeah, needs. Thank, th thank you, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, it's so rushed. It was so interesting. We could, have, you know, spent a lot more time, but unfortunately, because it's a Thursday morning, we have first ministers, etc., and we have business to discuss in private afterwards as well. But thank you for, very much for your contributions. Um, I now begin to private session and uh, basically that's it.